Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 136, featuring the third and final part of my interview with Mr. Peter Oliphant. In this part of the interview, we start off talking about Free DC, uh, followed by the game you've all been waiting to hear about, Stone Keep. And indeed, uh, Peter delivers <laughs> the goods. Uh, we get all of the uh, really nasty details about the game's production and politics. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff there. So without further ado, here is Mr. Peter Oliphant. Well, before we get into Stonekeep, I do want to talk a little bit about this game, uh, Free DC. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> talk about pulling a, shall we say, a very small nugget in the thing, but I do have stories about that, too. But, yeah, it's Free well, DC. Yeah, so it's, yeah, CinemaWare sort of collapses, I guess, and you form this company, or not you, but, I mean, this company forms, or, or you actually form the company. No, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Cineplay. Doug Sharp, and I forget who his partner was at the time, but yes, who were, in fact, CinemaWare people, like you said. And what happened is, is they just... I, the, my only involvement with that is exactly one day. I was only on that project one <laughs> day. What it is is Doug Sharp wanted... I, I don't remember the entire thing, but he wanted... Um, just some design work. He just wanted me to present some ideas on how to do some stuff. One of it was how to do the video system for it. So I wrote up how you do a video system. He actually flew me out to, I think he was in Minnesota, I believe that's where he lived, for a day. Spent some time with him. I then went home. It was the easiest money I ever made. I spent one day writing down my thoughts about the idea, and I got paid $1,000. So... You know, my involvement with that game is extremely minimal. But yes, I'm on the credits. And how did you even You're not know? You're saying that to distance yourself from this project, are you? Because uh, it didn't. Work my understanding that. was it was not that great of a. Uh, it, not, used not, a not a hit on the cells. Uh, <laughs> no, it used claymation type. It used clay figures for the graphics. It looks cool. I, I was looking at some screenshots, and it looks really cool. It looks surrealistic in a certain way. It was not the style people liked at the time. Meaning today we're more we're more open to different visual styles. There was a certain visual style of that time that was considered. I say what? Say it again. Oh, nineteen ninety one is what I have for the. Yeah, it was. It, it just didn't work that time. Plus, it was definitely a matter of taste. Meaning not everybody likes that. Where everybody did like, for the most part, the kind of graphics you'd find it. Like think of Pac Man. I mean Pac Man. Very symbolic, very... I, I, the problem with Free DC is you, if you're going to get close to realism, if you only go halfway to realism, it kind of looks weird to people. Meaning, if you don't have really live people and, and you have this other end, which is all animation, but in the middle, which is claymation, where they look almost real, but they're not real, people get weirded out by that. That's just my theory about it, but they just don't accept it. We either accept a perfect face or a symbolic face, but anything that tries to look perfect that isn't, we go, ugh. It's like, oh, it's, it's sort of like... museum type stuff. Yeah. If, if, if you take a, a live person and you just take one eye and move it up like this, you know, all of a sudden you're freaked out. The guy looks hideous, and yet all he has is just an eye that's up a quarter of an inch higher than the other one. So imagine clay with all the distortion and stuff like that. So, yes, I like it. You liked it. They liked it. Many people liked it, but not enough people liked it. That's the problem. All right, well, let's get to the game everybody's probably been just dying to hear about. <laughs> Stone. I'm, I'm sure you want to talk about. So, uh, yeah, Stone Keep. So how do you move uh, from Lexicross and, uh, you know, games of this sort to, you know, a full-on uh, computer role-playing game with all the full motion video and, and everything? You know, just uh, can you sort of just sort of set up the story of uh, the beginning part of this uh, game process? Oh, that's easy. In fact, if you got an hour. <laughs> no, <laughs> here's how it goes. First of all, Lexicross and Stonekeep were done by the same company, which was Interplay. They liked my work on Interplay, I'm, I'm sorry, on, on Lexacross so much, they wined and dined me to do Lexacross. We were at the Computer Game Developers Conference. Uh, let's see, Brian Fargo, his producer at the time, which is Michael Quarles, and there was a couple other people, I don't remember who they were. We went out and had dinner, and he's telling me, I want you to do this game. We really like the fact that with Lexacross, not only did you do the game, but you put all these little extras in it. One of my extras is, is that when you sign in to Lexacross, you type in your, um, your, what should I call it, your birthday. And 
you don't know why you do that, but it turns out that if you play the game on your birthday as a contestant, it says, oh, we'd like to thank, we'd like to, whatchamacallit, wish such and such a happy birthday. And we could, I put this in there, we had to take it out. It would then show you the words to happy birthday, but it turns out, believe it or not, the words to happy birthday are under copyright law, and so we couldn't use it. But he liked me. Oh, the other thing is, if you look out the window, on uh, where you sign up for it, there's a window there, and if it's summer, it's hot outside, and if it's winter, you see it's snowing outside. Things you don't need in the gameplay, but add to the ambiance. That's what Brian Fargo liked, and he wanted me to add that to it. So he whined and dined me about the game, and he gave me this outrageously, ridiculously great deal proposal, which was, we'll give you... I. These numbers might not be accurate, but they're pretty close. We'll give you 10% of the game. We'll give you 20% of any sequel. We'll give you this percentage of all distribution rights. We'll give you this in terms of any marketing, any uh, merchandising that's done elsewhere. I even had, like I said, rights to the sequel. In other words, I would get paid for that. This deal was so good that I didn't even go to a lawyer. I just said, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was it, there was no negatives to it. It was like, we'll give you this, we'll give you this, we'll give you this, we'll give you this. In fact, I didn't have any time limits or anything, which comes into play later on. Um, so what happened is, as I said, sure, I'll, I will do this. Now, the first meeting we have in order to do Stone Keep was, I remember it was an outside cafe again. We're sitting there and eating. And to tell you, you're going to get a really kind of a charge about how early this is in the game industry because when they tell me what this game has to be, which was basically this, we want a first person, full screen RPG, which, and animated as well. At that time, most games were either still picture or they had no animation, they weren't full screen, they'd have like information along the side and a little partial screen if there was any animation. So this was gonna be a big jump in the thing. Plus it was kind of like the first concept of a 3D game. It fakes 3D, but it's sort of like a 3D concept. Well, I remember hearing this, and I have this great deal I'm going to do, which I'm going to take, but I remember thinking quite positively to myself, and quite calmly to myself at the time of, well, of course this game is impossible. There is no way this can be done with today's market. But I had been in the game industry long enough to know that what is impossible to do, you shoot for where the moon is, you don't shoot for where, I mean, you shoot where the moon's going to be, you don't shoot for where the moon is. So I still take it. Now, to give you an idea, this is what I mean about how long it goes. Two of the things that I could not require in the game was a hard drive and a mouse. <laughs> okay? That may give you an idea of how far back we are going at this point. We could not require a mouse and we could not require a hard drive. This had to play off of floppies entirely. Which ends up being, okay, so I do the thing. I'm the only person on this game. I have one producer who interacts with me as the connection, but he's working on other things. His name is Michael Quarles. He's working on Claymation. There's another couple of Claymation games they did, which are more different than DC because these characters are not human characters, so it sort of does well. But he's busy all the time, and he's supposed to get me the graphics, and I'm doing the actual 3D engine. And he was a little bit slow about getting me the graphics, so therefore I couldn't demo it as well as I would have liked to. So at one point, Brian, after about 18 months, got a little bit worried about this. And instead of me being entirely in charge of the product, he gave entire control over to the producer. Uh, that had kind of a heated conversation between me and the producer on the phone about that because, first of all, I was under the impression I was in control, and he was trying, he did not let me know, the producer, that Brian had said this, and he was telling me all these things that had been done with the game, and I go, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing it again, and then I found out that Brian had made them control, so I go, okay, I have to listen to what you're saying, so I accepted the fact that he was a producer. One of the problems I had was is that this is a game where you move from square to square. We don't have full freedom of 3D motion, we just move from, from square to square. I naturally, and you can see this as being natural, had the guy move from center of square to center of square. The producer changed that. He wanted to move from edge of square to edge of square. And I told him there's all sorts of problems with that, but he wouldn't listen to me. Let me tell you what some of the problems are. There's no symmetry in turning. For example, when I turn, let's say I'm standing on a square and I turn. Well, now I'm on the other side of the square. So imagine there's a monster in the same square as me. All I have to do is turn, and all of a sudden I'm behind him. By me turning in place, I'm now behind him. 
None of that made any sense. Plus, now the graphics aren't symmetric, meaning now we have to have, if you're turning, you're a little bit off from the actual center, so the graphics look a little strange. The other thing is, is and this is where why the game went on forever. First of all, the game was, program, uh, was set up to be a $50,000 budget and a nine-month program. Well, that got eventually extended to five years, and I'm now explaining as to why this is happening, because... The guys that were doing the graphics, they wanted us to be 3D. So they gave me the restriction at first that this had to run on a 640K machine. K, remember we're talking K now, which is the maximum amount that IBM could take at the time. Uh, now the problem was that they gave me the first set of graphics of the first monster. <laughs> this is the only time I actually got mad at, at Brian, and he sort of recognized this, because when he told me I had a restriction of 640K, I was going, well, you know, by the time this is done, we're probably going to have memory past that, but he wouldn't listen to that. And so the graphics were sent, sent me in the first character, and the graphics were like 120 frames and took up 700K. And so I walked up to Brian and I said, uh, where, where of this 700K am I supposed to put this? Uh, how am I supposed to put this 700K into this 640K machine? And this is one. The, this is one. The monster. I have to know. <laughs> <laughs> one graphic. And by the way, this pissed off the the artists to no end because they thought they had this total graphic freedom. They're going to be able to have 120 part animations with full stuff. And I go, okay, reduce that down to four frames, please. And they did not like that at all. So we're first of all, starting to see some problems with the graphics. The other thing is, is they eventually decided to go to live graphics, live animated graphics where they actually photograph actors and then digitize that later. Now, Needless to say, the producer wanted to save money in the beginning. So what he did is, now I'm part of Hollywood, I know you don't do this, but he set up the blue screen outside and had the actors do their photographing outside. What's wrong about that is as the sun changes in any kind of a normal day, it changes the blueness of the blue screen. So it turns out that when they did it this way, every single frame had to be processed separately. You couldn't like do a remove blue type thing. So that caused a problem. The other thing is, so they had to redo them again. They went into a, and also the lighting, if you do that, the lighting changes for the people. In other words, one frame it looks bright, another frame they look dark. So they redid all the graphics by going into a movie studio. Now, why they didn't employ me or use my expertise, having been in Hollywood, to at least supervise these things, I have no idea, but they decided to do it themselves. They come back to me with the graphics. Now, by the way, at this time, we're starting to get up into, oh, yeah, it's a one, gig, one meg game. Oh, yeah, it's a two meg game. Oh, yeah, you can have a hard drive. Oh, yeah, you can have a mouse, stuff like that, meaning as we progress, hardware is getting a little bit more fluent and more uh, the minimum system could, rec could have these things at this point. Um, they give me these graphics, and the producer, I have no idea why he didn't consider this. The producers give me the graphics, and they're the fighting graphics. And what he did is so he wanted complete clarity is he filmed them from the waist up. And I looked at him and I said, well, what happens if you back up? You're going to be able to see they don't have any legs. All of the legs at that point were being drawn in by hand, by frame, by the artist till they realized that didn't work. And they went back to the market again and refilmed everything again, realizing they needed the legs. Had they just come to me filming it, I would have pointed that out instantly, but they didn't do that. Now... This, uh, as the game gets bigger and bigger, they realize they can't work off of seven, seven floppies because floppies isn't the thing anymore. There's an interesting now sort of a nasty story at this point because we're now two years into it and Brian did not count on this being this way. So he goes, you know that really great deal I gave you? I don't want to keep that deal anymore. I want to start giving you half the percentages of everything we're talking about and stuff like that. And I kept thinking, well, what you're basically telling me is you want me to take a I've been on the project for two years. You want me to take a retroactive pay cut for two years because this is what I've been working toward. But at first I thought he was calling me to cancel the product because it was so expensive. So at first I said yes. But they didn't send me a contract with respect to that. So I had time to think about it and I'm going, well, why would I sign away something I already own without getting something in return? So I said no. It turns out that in order to do the project, which I was working at home, they moved me close to where the office was and put me into a hotel and were paying for that hotel. When I tur said that I was no longer going to take their deal, they played some funny games where they didn't pay the hotel room and I was locked out of my hotel for a while. So there was some strange political 
aspects going on there. But eventually, uh, we did get it done uh, about four years into the project. Oh, at one point, I walk up to Brian and I say, I know how we can cut the money so that you don't have to cut my money and do everything. Instead of we doing this on floppies, let's do it on a CD-ROM because CD-ROM is an emerging uh, technology at the time. And he goes, no, I've, he goes, I've had experience with that. If you take a game which already exists, which I didn't understand because Stonekeep didn't exist, and put it on that, that there's an expectation it'll be better than the original game, and so it's a bad way of marketing it. So he says we can't do that. Well, needless to say, six months later, Brian Fargo comes to the decision that this game should go on CD-ROM. <laughs> At which point, it was hard from at that point to argue to cut down my percentages because, indeed, this was a way of saving money. So I kept my percentages, and we got four years into the project because now we're on CD-ROM. We had feature creep like there was no tomorrow. At one point, about two years into it, we went to CES, and I demoed it in front of 200 members of the crowd. And there's a funny story about that in that the producer, who was also a programmer, he actually did battle chess, um, he was working on the sound. And so we get to the thing, we're setting it up, and I don't know if I would have ever admitted this to the president, but the sound worked. And he go, the, pre, the guy looks over to the president, I'm sitting there, he goes, that's the first time the sound has ever worked. And I'm thinking, you're admitting to something that you worked on in front of 200, I mean, in front of 200 members of the, of the press, and if this hadn't worked, we would have looked like idiots, but it did work, but he admitted that. Um, the funny part is, is it, that was kind of a fun demo, because first of all, I was scared to death, funny for someone in Hollywood to be afraid in front of a group of people, but I was. And when I demoed it, something bad happened that turned out to be great, that it didn't work the first time that it came up. And so... I all of a sudden after I give a little speech, I am very calm when I'm when I'm allowed to speak my own words. But if I have to read what I what I was supposed to prepare, I was nervous, and that's when I got nervous. So when it didn't work, I looked over at the people and I said, "What do you think of it so far?" And they all just burst out into laughing. So they kept working on it, and it didn't work again. And I said, "Well, now for a little song and dance," and they loved that too. Finally, it got to work, and. We had had this 3D mouse system that we had stuck to it, which we never went with it ever, but this was kind of cool to demo it. And I was the one demoing it. So I took the 3D mouse, and it's up in the sky, and the, the what do we call it, the um, sword is going in accordance to me, and I'm doing this. It turns out Johnny Wilson, who was Computer Gaming World's editor at the time, was sitting, I guess, in the perfect spot, and he said that my hands corresponded to the hands on the screen perfectly so it looked like I was literally holding the screen I'm holding the sword on the screen it turns out this got massively great reviews I mean most magazines said this was the hit of the show and I couldn't help but think and somebody walked up and says oh well, you just planned the part where it didn't work so we'd all know it wasn't just a video so it actually worked that it didn't work because now they knew they were seeing something interactive instead I'm mentioning this because that's why more money was thrown into the project. In fact, by the time it was done, there was uh, over 200 people that worked on the project, even though it was my project to begin with. And which, by the way, I wrote the story for. I wrote the entire story and like that, the the the, the framing story, not all the stuff in the middle. And um, so they well, decided your creation. Yes. Yes. It, they they put more money into it, and as a result, that's why we asked for the new deal, because there were 200 people, of the people that did the fireworks, the fire just graphics in it, were the people that did the backdraft uh, special effects. So they even hired those guys to do this kind of a thing. Finally, after four years into the project, I realized we were going through feature creep like there was no tomorrow. And so after four years, we got everybody together, and we realized it was going to go for a fifth year. At that point... And keep in mind, I've been commissioned to do this thing on a ninety on a nine month contract, which is the only thing that still existed as a deal between us. So I took kind of a bold move, and I walked up to uh, up to the uh, uh, producer, and I said, "We need to change how this is done." He goes, "Well, we don't like." They were paying me this way; they were paying me five thousand dollars a month set fee to work on the project, and they said, "Well, we don't think you're doing as much work as you should be for that." So let's. What we want you to do is write down milestones, and we write down the milestones and then put a, a price figure on it. We'll approve those, and then you can get those, and we'll pay you those amounts. So I did that. I wrote down the milestones, put values. They approved of them, and then after the first month when I made $20,000, they said, could we go back to the $5,000 a month deal? 
And I go, well, instead of doing that, why don't we set up a bunch of things, milestones, that if I do these milestones, I am done with the project. So they set up the milestones. I did them. I was done. And I said, I am done. And they go, well, we want more milestones for you to do. And I go, I'm sorry. Four years on this project. I'm burned out. And I also realized something else. As long as I'm still on the project, they feel that they can keep adding features to it. As soon as I'm out of there, they get a little panicky and they go, oh, we better just live with what we have. I honestly think that my negotiating, my getting out after four years, which is what I did, and they still worked on the project a year more, is why it became a viable project, is because they were forced to actually consolidate and put out a product which was done within a year, and when it came out, it went triple platinum, got all sorts of awards and stuff like that. So that was all pretty cool, but they still didn't like me. They actually published articles about how I was, I was the reason it was five years late and stuff like that, which is kind of a sore point. But I've now gotten back. I've talked to these guys again, and we're all friends again and stuff like that. But there's a lot of politics that go into this thing. But to, my negotiating, my out negotiation was pretty cool because uh, I'd never had this ever before. It was my goal, and it, it, one of the worst things you never have is actually have your lifetime goal satisfied. My goal was to make $100,000 in a year, and when I signed my exit contract from Stonekeep, which I kept some rights still, they did the really cool thing, I thought, is there was the, con which of course I negotiate with a lawyer. This you negotiate with a lawyer. They had the contract there for me to sign with this really wonderful check for $100,000 <laughs> sitting on top of it. It's like, okay, I'll sign this. And by the way, the actual negotiating deal was for over $200,000. So I literally made over half a million dollars on that project. Oh, and made, the cool part was, to me, they gave, when I left, they gave another guy the head programming position. Of course, they gave him all sorts of accolades, and he became the head of Stonekeep 2. And I called him up, and I didn't. He and I didn't really get along too well because he was also one of the programmers on Stokeep One before I before I left. And I called him up, and I said, "Look, now that you're the head of this, you've got to know these things. This is what they're going to do. They're going to give you the project. They're not going to be satisfied with what you do. They're going to put someone else in control. I'm going to take it away, and all this stuff." And he goes, "Yeah, okay, I understand that." And I said, "It's probably going to go a long time." And he goes, "Yeah, but he wasn't really listening to me." Well, in my negotiations. I, as you understood, owned part of Stonekeep too. So they paid me $25,000 to give up my rights to Stonekeep too. Well, five years after Stonekeep too, guess what? Without me being there is the only way I can explain it because I had everybody else on the team. They couldn't put out Stonekeep too, and they canceled it. So I am the only person on the planet that has ever benefited from Stonekeep too, which never existed. And I don't know what happened to that guy, but... Uh, Oh, the other kind of interesting story about Stonekeep would be that when I got my first royalty check, because I'd gone through the negotiations the way I had, almost all interplay contracts were based on, we're going to give you this amount of money as an advancement on royalties. In other words, if we give you $50,000, the royalties pay that back before we start giving the actual royalty amount. Well, my contract was a buyout. It had nothing to do with the amount of money being paid to me was an advance on royalties. So they quite literally threw up the correct numbers there, which is what, well, we would ordinarily pay you $40,000, but since we have $100,000, $200,000 that we paid you this, we're taking that against that. And I called my lawyer and I go, that's not the way it is. And he goes, well, I think that is. And then he looked at the contract and I was like, oh, no, you're right. Any royalties are just pure. So I called up uh, Sierra Online and I said, you owe me this money, which the next month they had to pay me the forty thousand dollars but the hard part again the politics of the situation is the next month that came up there was this odd accounting on my royalty statement that said that I am now responsible for four hundred thousand dollars of co-op advertising and that that has to be accounted for before I get any royalties so I've never gotten another royalty check in my life in hindsight I should have waited six months waited till the six months of accumulation stuff, uh, accumulation of uh, royalties that happened, and then pointed it out because they changed the rules. I probably would have gotten $30,000 every month for about four or five months and then been able to mention it, but never got another penny from it. So it's the, it's just the way it works, and it sort of leaves you in a certain sense with a bad taste in your mouth because you do this work, and you, I mean, when I was working on Stonekeep, I was, I, my life was dedicated to Stonekeep for four years. I literally got to a point, and I bet you most programmers will tell you this, that 
after the end of four years, I could work at most four hours on the program, after which I literally would get a headache so bad. It was my body telling me, you got to stop doing this, that I felt physically sick. I mean, I literally couldn't keep working on it. That was one of the reasons I negotiated out. I put my heart and soul into that. And so that's kind of the way that went. And um, nowadays, if they ever, I actually still have rights to it. If they ever tried to mass market it, I'm supposed to get a percentage of that. But so many people have changed people, people there that I don't even think they understand that the contract exists anymore. And plus, What's it been now? Over 20 years? I don't even know if contracts exist that long. So so that's kind of Stonekeep in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a terrible, terrible uh, political nightmare, a mess. I'm just, you know, sort, sort of as somebody who's seen Hollywood and seen the, the software industry, how would you compare the two just in terms of nastiness? Um, I would say they're probably... I, I didn't get associated with so much nastiness in Hollywood, but let me explain why I think that's the case. I think Hollywood probably went through a similar phase, but grew out of it. I, I Probably Buster Keaton may have had these same problems when he decided, when they went to talkies, and he goes, I want to do talkies too, and they go, well, I'm sorry, but you know, you only do... I mean, he probably had these kind of problems. So, and Hollywood has a better model. One of the things the game industry really has to start considering is paying people by the hour because what happens in the game industry is when people get paid by salaries they go okay we've got you for a fixed amount of money now let's work you for sixty hours a week or eighty hours a week or six days or seven days a week and the point is, is that's taking advantage of the situation if these people had to get paid by the hour then they would keep these schedules down and the budgets down to absolutely appropriate for the workforce that they have and the reason I'm mentioning that is that's the model Hollywood uses meaning when I was an extra on Deadwood, like we, discuss, like we discussed, I was being paid minimum wage. But let me tell you, I got that. If I worked for one hour, I got paid for eight hours, no matter what. If I worked one minute after eight hours for the next time, I got paid time and a half. If I worked lighter than that, I got double time. This is what the extras that work for non union uh, go for is overtime because the most I ever got paid in a day was 300 bucks this way. I mean, it is possible to get up to those prices. So, in contrast, the game industry, under the same circumstance, would just say, work longer, we'll pay you the same amount. And in that sense, the game industry is nastier, but in the day-to-day -day relationships, you feel a little bit uh, better with them because you feel more like an individual with the game industry than you do as an extra in the movie industry because there, they consider it nice if they're feeding you in a certain sense. They actually, in the, in the movie industry, to give you an idea, on Deadwood, they had every Friday this lottery where they would call everybody together. The producer, being a nice guy, would literally believe this or not, his name is David Milch, would hand out $20,000. He would spin wheels and hand out $20,000 to people that were uh, in the crew. The extras were ineligible. We were kept off to the side. We were the, and the extras, many of them were living out of their cars to work on that show. They were homeless people. We had the thought that they kind of kept us in the homeless mentality because it was good for the show, meaning the people on the show as extras, our part on the show is to look as these people that were trying to be making it rich and were poor. It kind of kept us in the mindset, so they kind of like that. But in that sense, that's crueler because than what the game industry, because at least the game industry, even they only pay you for what you earn, they typically pay you a hell of a lot more than what they will in Hollywood. Now, if you're an actor, that's an entirely different thing. If As an actor, my God, they treat you like royalty whenever you're in there, which is more to keep you in the right mindset because being able to act has a lot to do with, it, you can't act happy if you're emotionally sad, and that's probably why they do that. So that's kind of a comparison of the two uh, areas of uh, business that I've been in. I've also been a school teacher too, but that's at college, not at your degree, I was a TA, but I've taught at the college level calculus, and so that, which is what you what you do, I got away from it. Even though my goal as a kid was to become a teacher, I discovered that when I finally started teaching, I loved teaching my first class, and then when I had to teach the set that same class the second semester, I'm going, but I've already done this, and that's where I lose it as a teacher. Whereas I don't, I don't get off on the fact that there's different people in the class. I'm more experiencing it myself. So that shows you the three comparisons there. I like in, I like the game industry and the movie industry because every day is different, but they definitely have different ways of dealing with people. So, but they all want to minimize 
maximize profit and minimize what they give out. A, bet, a, a real fast story about uh, what you call it in uh, Deadwood is I was given. I once had to do this one scene where I was walking out in the rain, which they usually give you a bump, which is an extra amount of money for. And I had to walk into a room where there's smoke, and they give you extra money for that. And when I walked up to them at the end of the day and said, okay, I get money for this and that, and they go, no, you have to pick one of those. You only get one of them. But I did both of them, and we're talking $10. They wouldn't give me $10. And by the way, the uh, producer on the show was making half a million dollars an episode. So why they wouldn't give me $10. It's weird how people just don't sometimes want to pay you what you're due. And so, yeah. But that's that's the kind of stuff that I go through all the time. But it kind of makes life fun, too. I mean, it's more interesting that way than if everything just works out all the time. Although, and it makes good stories, too. <laughs> well, obviously, you're proud of your, your work on Stone Keep. You were showing me your, your T-shirt a while ago. Yes. If you wouldn't, wouldn't mind turning around there so sure. we can see the... see it now? Wearing the shirt, Stone Keep Core Development Team looks great. I want one of those uh, shirts to wear on the show. <laughs> do, you have, do you have any extra? Do I have any what of those I do is this? I might videotape, or not, I mean, take a picture of it and then put it up on Facebook or something. Because I don't think I have the back end of this on Facebook. So I have it, one of my other T-shirts on there that I photographed from Deadwood because I'm proud of that one too. But yeah, I might do that. So you can have a picture of it at least. <laughs> there there so is there the are. box. You can you can actually see the uh, logo there. You can see the name Interplay down here as an advertisement for it. <laughs> so we're and talking six hundred dollars for that. It's almost impossible to tell here, but this is a hologram image, meaning there's actually depth to this that you can see down in it. And even though it part of one of the, the money eye things, with that sword. oh yes, <laughs> there, you can't see it, but there's an insignia here. Why well, you can't see it, but. There's a little elephant insignia there because my last name's Oliphant and that was my insignia. It says on there, my insignia, but part of my contract said that they had to put created by and it says programmed by. So again, sometimes politics works in your favor. Uh, Interplay had to pay me a $20,000 fine for using the word programmed instead of created. So, you know, sometimes these pol political things work in reverse as well. <laughs> and I got, I got a lot of money, like I said, but... Unfortunately, that lot of money actually has hurt me because now when I go and try and get a job somewhere else, they go, well, you're used to this amount of money, so you're not, I mean, I'm interested in doing the work. I'm not that interested in the money as much as I am as doing the work. And so it's turned out to be kind of a, a, a stopgap for me because it's sort of like if somebody has a really successful TV show, people aren't going to get them for low budget films because they think, well, you want more money than that, even if they're willing to do the work, so. So yes, that was the uh, that was the box, and uh, you notice that it looks like a tombstone too. It's made to look <laughs> like a tombstone, which is I know the whole thing. Steel seal, but you did play. Oh, this you did play the finished game. I... Actually, that's an interesting story. I never really played the game, and I even though I designed the end scene. The end scene is this: the whole concept I came up with is is that you're collecting nine orbs, and each orb corresponds to a planet. And the end strategy game is you take the nine planets and put them on the pedestal in appropriation of their distance from the Earth, which means, and by the way, there's two solutions because I think Mars and Venus switch their positions with respect to which is farther. So there were two solutions. Even though I designed all that, I only recently got to see that because someone posted that on YouTube. So I've just now gotten to see the final. Oh! As for, uh, one thing you did ask me is how did I transition to an RPG? That's a really interesting question because I had never done an RPG. I had never played RPGs and was not into RPGs. And so it was kind of strange for them to give me that quality. And so when I was done, oh, by the way, why didn't I play the game? When you've been working on a game for four years, your desire to play the game is about negative 10%. <laughs> it's, it's sort of like if you've been editing, uh, I'm sure people that have edited films for like 20 hours want to watch the film like 0% for about the first you know year or so afterwards. You're just so burned out on the game, you don't even want to do it. Uh, and But the odd part is the kind of funny thing is now RPGs, I live by RPGs. I play Stone Key, I mean, I'm sorry, I play City of Heroes, I play World of Warcraft. Those are my games now. So today I would love to design an RPG. It seems I'm always doing things before I get to the point that I enjoy doing them, but maybe that's how come I get to the point that I enjoy doing them. So, 
Well, Peter, what are you up to now? You want to? I think we're kind of at the end of the what, interview what here, I... so uh, you know, I don't know what if you got something that you want to promote or talk about that we haven't covered. I am actually I've got a few ideas that I am planning on trying to market. I've done demos. One of the things I've done is I've created a brand new computer language. It's not just not just a new language, it's a new genre of language, it's a new form of language to give you some ideas. There's absolutely there's zero possibility of doing a syntax error. You cannot write an infinite loop. And yet and it's more natural language. It's the kind of language that I think that you would want to teach kids could learn this you could teach this to a four-year-old type thing or a five-year-old so that's one of the things I'm promoting what I've done for that is I've written the language I've written up a document for it I've written up three games that work under that language so I'm trying to promote that Lexacross that I mentioned I have a demo for that and I also have another game which I consider to be it, it's sort of like Minesweeper but it's a different form of Minesweeper that I think uh, Microsoft would want because it fits into their little uh, set of games they have like hearts and stuff like that. This would be uh, a different form of Minesweeper that would be compatible and be able to exist with their existing Minesweeper. So that's what I'm doing. I'm currently unemployed. I am uh, consider myself a lone wolf, but if some game company decided to give me a huge salary or something to work for them, I would. But I would prefer right now that something I've always wanted to do and I've had a problem with is I want to be a game designer and what happens to me is I walk into an interview and say I want to be a game designer and they say yes you have lots of experience designing oh wait you can program we'd rather you program for us and I go I don't want to program I go okay fine next and it's like well what happened to the game design interview it's like I now have a resume that I put out there that completely doesn't list any of my programming experience because it is actually causing me problems trying to get design stuff. So if anyone out there wants a <laughs> game designer that has, you know, what is it, like 30 years experience and has uh, designed like 20 games, anytime you programmed on a games, you do a high percentage of the of the design because you're the one doing all the little itty bitty details of design. They say they want a bridge in the game and you're the one that decides how the bridge works, how big it is, where it goes, that kind of stuff. So there's plenty of that. So I have far more, I, I would be, I'm sort of like more important if I can design because I can program one game a year, but I could design six games a year. So start using me more to my advantage than what you think is the thing that you want me to use for. And yes, I will still program prototypes and still use my programming expertise to know what is possible and what isn't possible, but that's the direction I want to go is design, so I'm interested in design work. <laughs> that's really interesting. I never thought that being a good programmer would actually impair your ability to get design work. It does. It's only because another an example of that would be it's sort of like people sort of bait and switch themselves. I when I brought Lex across to Mastermind, which is uh, now um, who am I? It's Virgin Software. Virgin Software is the one. I brought it to the president, and this is before obviously Interplay got a hold of it. This is when I was, actually Interplay eventually gets a hold of it by virtue of me farming it like this. And I showed it to them, he likes the game. And he goes, but Virgin was more interested in games with licenses. So they go, well, we could probably attach, uh, you know, uh, Believe It or Not to this. And I pointed out how Believe It or Not was kind of limiting because there were so many other things that could we do with this. And he goes, yeah, you're right. I guess it wouldn't work with Believe It or Not. Okay, we don't want the game. It's like, well, you wanted the game before you mentioned Believe It or Not. Now you don't want it because you mentioned Believe It or Not and because it won't work. I mean, they bait and switch themselves. They talk themselves out of the game. And like I said, uh, had they taken it, uh, it did well at least. Oh, by the way, Lexacross got hugely great reviews. Games Magazine, which I don't know if it still exists, but Games Magazine gave it a 10 out of 10. So... Those are the things I live for. I live for the little people. I love it when I hear someone's played my game. One of the biggest things I ever had fun with is I once went to a Fry's when Stonekeep had just come out. And I mentioned to the guy that I did the game, so they they did this one uh, announcement over the speaker that the guy who did Stonekeep is here. And so a couple people walked up to me and had me sign their copies. And it was just like, oh, man, I really felt I was going to – at the end of that, I had all this money, everything was going well, and I thought, I've just made it in Hollywood. In fact, I had age, I had a, a personal manager uh, sign up with me. He wanted 10% of everything I had, and I, I was with him for about a year. I mean, I had people coming to me for success after Stonekeep, and yet uh, then 
whenever I talk about design it, or the, and they notice that I made that much money on Stonekeep, it's either I cost too much or they want me to program instead of design. So that, in that sense, it's been a hindrance. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a brand new retrospective. Now I still have the, the list from last time, but if you have a, an idea or a game that you just really want me to cover, let me know. Uh, what I did last time, same thing I'm going to do this time, is make a list of the games uh, that you have suggested and then roll my trusty D20 and see what comes up. So could be anything. So make your suggestions and I'll uh, be happy to add them to the list. Um, as always, I want to thank you if you have donated to the show. It's really, really important to me. It makes a big difference. It keeps the show alive. So thank you, thank you, thank you guys if you have donated. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, now let's look at this Ale of the Week. Uh, this week I have a Bitter Woman IPA. <laughs> I, uh, I saw this in the, in the store and I was really... As soon as I saw the label, I knew I had to have it. Bitter Woman IPA. This is brewed in, actually, uh, pretty close to home in Lake Mills, Wisconsin, uh, by the Tiranina Brewing Company. You know, I don't think I've had any, any of their other brews. Um, I was looking all over this, and I do not see... I see a great story about how they came up with the name Bitter Woman, uh, but I do not see an alcohol content, so I have no idea. Uh, so let's just open this up and... And see what the <laughs> bitter woman tastes like. All right, I have a horn of bitter woman. Let's give her a taste. Ooh. Okay, that. <laughs> okay, this ale is aptly named. Uh, this is a very bitter, 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 bitter um, IPA. Actually, a little too bitter, I think. Not very tasty, <laughs> to say, unless you really like bitter things. Not really much of a smell. You know, not much to, uh, uh, to whiff, uh, but you can definitely taste that going down. I don't know, you know, I have no idea what the alcohol content is. I, I don't really taste a lot of alcohol. And the only thing I really taste is that bitterness. Uh, so, you know, again, I guess uh, with this, if you like bitter stuff, you'll like this. Otherwise, I would stay well away from the bitter woman. <laughs> All right, guys, let's uh, wrap this up. I have a quotation from Buster Keaton, and I was really impressed with this quotation, and it goes something like this. Tragedy is a close-up. Comedy is a long shot. See you guys next week. Kids. <laughs>